So one of the older items that we have in the vault is this 1665 study um, by Robert Hooke. It is called Micrographia. Robert Hooke was a famed English scientist. He was the first person to coin the use of the word cell. Um, he used this term when he was examining a piece of cork under, um, under a microscope. Uh, he later then applied that term to living plant tissue that he also studied under a microscope. Um, so this study um, includes all of his work where he studied microorganisms and other small um, living organisms and inanimate objects underneath a microscope and replicated what he saw in very, very detailed illustrations. Uh, this study was published by the Royal Society of London for Improving Natural Knowledge, and it was actually the first publication of the Royal Society. This copy of Micrographia that we have in the vault is actually a first printing, first edition of this. Now, as the book was printed in 1665, it's possible that the binding itself was replaced at some point over the years, um, but, but the pages themselves are original to their first printing. This book contains about 30 highly detailed plates of plants, insects, and other microorganisms, showing how they would appear when viewed under a microscope. Of these 30 drawings, about 12 of them are fold-outs. This is when a, an image is printed onto a piece of paper that is intentionally larger than the rest of the book, um, so that it can be then folded in to fit with the book. Uh, it, it serves to create a rather eye-catching uh, image. Uh, for example, here this is a rather close-up view of the face of a fly when viewed under a microscope. You can see the really detailed illustrations of the eye and the facial formations. Uh, in addition to um, showing um, biological um, items such as plants or insects, um, Robert Hooke also studied inanimate objects under the microscope. Um, these are man-made items such as razors or in this illustration a needle when viewed under a microscope. Uh, this was to show the difference between um, purposely produced items and uh, natural, uh, natural organisms. Uh, last we're going to show here is an up-close image of a plant cell and you can see why Robert Hooke would have um, coined the use of the word cell when seeing um, plant tissue viewed under a microscope. You can see that rigid box-like structure. This book was published in 1685. It is part of the Millsaps collection. Let's see, circle M. Major John Ephraim Thomas Millsaps was born in Houston. He became an officer in the Salvation Army, and during his travels with that work, he collected a lot of books, many of which were on natural history, and this is one of those. Um, the title of this, De Insectis, it's a work based on the work of Johann Godart, or here it's Latinized to Godartus. Um, who was one of the earliest authors on entomology, certainly the first to write on insects in Netherlands. And more importantly, he based his observations on, on first-hand observation. He went along the countryside collecting butterfly larvae and other larvae and put them in glass jars and watched them. He was an artist, really. Uh, his book actually was published in two volumes, in 1662 and 1667. What we have here, this 1685, is a Latin translation from the German to Latin, done by an Englishman named Lister. And he moved everything around, so you couldn't lay the two works side by side, but he did use the illustration is done by Godart, which are pretty amazing. This is like the 1600s, and it seems 
pretty commonplace to us to see drawings of larvae and insects. And be careful with this. It was a, a new study at the time. Another book that we are very fortunate to have. Most of the items that we have shown today are rare books that have been donated to the library and make up part of the library's special collections. However, books are not the only collection items that we keep here in the vault. This item here is a scrapbook that was donated to the library by the Hogg family and made by Miss Ima Hogg. Ima Hogg was born in 1882 and was the only daughter of Texas Governor James Stephen Hogg. Ima Hogg was a significant member of Houston Society and a lifelong philanthropist. She donated to cultural institutions such as universities, museums, and even the Houston Public Library. This particular scrapbook that was donated to us is quite interesting, as it is made entirely of dried and pressed herbs and flowers. This book is incredibly fragile, as it was made in 1908, and the pages are incredibly brittle, and the tape and glue that is holding the flower specimens in place is beginning to degrade. So to show these flower specimens, we do have to turn the pages extremely slowly and carefully. You can see some of the unique designs that she decided to include with her pressed flowers once they were flat enough to shape and mold to the design that she wanted. This scrapbook would have been made during a time when I'm a hog spent over a year long traveling in Europe as an abroad trip. An inscription on the back of the book lists that this was made in Harzburg, Germany, which was a spa town in Germany, and it would have been very popular for wealthy travelers from in the early 20th century. Now, not all of the pages on this scrapbook have been filled. In fact, several pages near the back are empty, which suggests that this would have been a project that I'm a hog was completing while she was abroad, and it might not have been able to be completed once she was back in the United States. But the images that we do have here in the scrapbook are very striking and beautiful. This pretty book was published in 1832. It's got gold hand stamping, and gold edges. It's a German work titled La Mousse der Metalmark. Do not speak German, but was able to determine that the translation of the title is Dried Specimens of Central Moravian Moss with short descriptions and details of their natural habitat. It's written by Friedrich Leopold Thiel. I haven't been able to discover a whole lot about him, but it's probably because I don't speak German. But Central Moravia is now part of the Czech Republic, and the first part of the book is all descriptions. But where it gets interesting, let's see, there's an index and the first column here gives a page number and the second column for most of them gives a number. And what that corresponds to is the numbers for the pressed specimens. The majority of the book is these press specimens, which is just, it's amazing. These are plants from 1832. I can't imagine how they produced this book. It would I would be curious to know how many were made. Hopefully we can figure that out. And in the back, this is not for circulation. I think it's very probable that from the first it was recognized that this, this was a book that had to be kept separate. One of the larger sections of our vault collection is our collection of donated rare children's literature. 
These volumes are a part of our Meldrum Room Children's Special Collections, and the items that were moved from the Meldrum Room into the Rare Books Room were items that were particularly rare or had historic value. This volume, in particular, is from a small printing of a special 100th edition of the rare children's classic, The Wind in the Willows, written by Kenneth Graham. This, this volume was published in 1951, almost 50 years after the first publication of the book. Um, it's bound in white pigskin, and it's illustrated with 12 full-color plates completed by Arthur Rackham. Arthur Rackham was a prolific illustrator, particularly in the genres of fantasy, fairy tales, and children's literature. And The Wind in the Willows was said to be a favorite of his. And it was actually one of the last projects that he completed before his death in 1939. The illustrations that seen here were originally used in the 1940 edition of the book, and used again for this 100th edition. The Wind in the Willows is filled with very detailed descriptions of the English countryside and the changing of the seasons, and these illustrations wonderfully depict the celebration of nature within the story. What we're looking at now is the Illustrated Natural History of Scotland. It was published in 1684, and we're pretty sure that this is the original binding because you can see the cords that are on there. Later on, those bumps were just more decorative than they were when they were actually needed to hold the book together. The Illustrated Natural History of Scotland is considered the most ambitious and thorough regional natural history completed during the 17th century. It was put together by Dr. Robert Sibbald, who of course was Scottish. He studied to become a doctor, which led to an interest in medicinal plants by 1667, he had co-founded a botanical garden of medicinal plants with a cousin of his, which eventually became the Royal Botanical Garden of Edinburgh. Um, in 1682, he was appointed James VII's physician and geographer royal, and in that same year, he sent out a, a questionnaire across Scotland inviting other gentlemen scholars to collaborate with him to create a record of the national knowledge of Scotland. And there's there's different sections on on plants and, and animals. Um, but there is, interestingly, an index, which is kind of neat. You might would be able to recognize some of the, the Latin names, of course, again. This is also, I should say, a part of the Millsaps collection. And the photos, or rather the pictures, illustrations, are all at the back. They're not in part of the, the text themselves, itself. We like the very tall bird. Where's the tall bird? I thought he was near the front. That's a neat fish. Really tall bird. This book that we have here is actually a periodical called The Monthly Flora or Botanical Magazine, which was a short lived publication from the mid 1800s that ran for only a few volumes. This copy of the first volume was printed in 1846 and it contains 70 different colored engravings. Uh, these are all detailed illustrations of different flower species. This particular copy that we have in the vault is a gift uh, to the library from Adele Luscan. Luscan was a founding member of the Ladies Reading Club in Houston, and she was a historical preservationist. The Ladies Reading Club is really important to the history of the Houston Public Library. They are the club who helped raise the funds to purchase the land uh, in which the first Carnegie Library was, was built. And the Ladies Reading Club then continued to volunteer and raise funds for the Houston Public Library for many years since. Uh, the colored illustrations that you see throughout this magazine are all lithographs. This is an early printing process that involves etching an original design onto a smooth stone or a metal plate that can then produce multiple copies of the same design by applying ink onto the surface of the stone. 
The images are highly detailed and the colors remain bright and vibrant even after 175 years. The tissue separators that you see here have been added to the book in order to protect both the printed pages and the images themselves so that they remain in as good of condition as they were when they were first printed. This book is in a limp vellum binding, uh, meaning it's a, a binding not based on boards, so there's nothing in here to keep the vellum or the skin straight, so it has kind of warped a little bit over time. But what this is is De Re Hortensi Libellus. It was first published in 1535, ours is from 1539 but is written by Charles Estigny. I don't speak French, so hopefully I'm getting that close. But he was a member of a prestigious uh, scholar printer family in Paris. He was studying medicine when he wrote this. It's a book for children teaching the Latin names of plants and trees with some French terms also included. But it describes the plants, how to identify them. There are no pictures is something we associate with children's books now. Um, but there is an index with the Latin names. And we still use the Latin names. So let's see, Crocus, you can see there. I guess that's probably Coriander. You see Gladiolus down here. But it's an early gardening book that we're very, very pleased to have. We hope that you've enjoyed this exploration of some of our rare items. If you have any questions about this program or about HMRC collections as a whole, please contact the Texas Room Reference at 832-393-1662 or txr.reference at houstontx.gov.